We are going to continue in our series on understanding and exploring worship. We've been getting some very positive reports of how people have been enjoying or had enjoyed it from Sunday morning, and so we're going to continue on. Exploring the meaning of true worship. It's very important. Uh, how many of you realize that we worship tonight? Yeah. <laughs> we, that's what we were doing before. We were worshiping as we should have. So I pray that you entered in, that you participated, uh, because some great things can happen when we give our hearts to Him. So we're going to pick up where we left off, but let's just begin at the top of our outlines there from great Psalm of David, Psalm 95. David said, O come, let us sing to the Lord, let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. Come before his presence with thanksgiving, let us shout joyfully to him with psalms. For the Lord is the great God, and a great king above all gods. And remember, it's a little g, right? The second god is definitely a little g. In his hands are the deep places of the earth, the majestic peaks are his also. The sea is his, for he made it. And his hands form the dry land. O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker, for He is our God. And we are the people of His pasture and the sheep of His hand. What a great, picturesque, moving psalm. Now, you remember in the first session, which was Sunday, we talked about the fact that people can have their opinions on worship and all this kind of stuff from church to church. But one thing is sure and certain in Scripture and that is that there's a distinction that's made in the Old Testament and the New Testament uh, between praise and worship. Now, some people can say, well, you're kind of splitting hairs. Not when you really define those terms, which I'm going to do for you in a moment. But there's a distinction made between praise and worship. That you can have a powerful, fun, lively song that opens up the night of praise, But that song that we just ended with a few minutes ago, right? Christ be all around us and before us and behind us. Can you feel how the the worship kicked in and billowed up to heaven? Okay, how many of you need prayer to feel that? No, we can do that first. You should have felt something very different happening in the last song, far different than you maybe you did in the first song. That's normal. And as I explained on Sunday, that's because when people walk through the door, all of us included, we're bringing in all kinds of baggage from the week or from the day. Headaches, naturally or spiritually, or emotionally. Baggage, hassles, stress, pressure, family issues, financial issues. Maybe you just found out your car needs a a transmission. And you say, I can afford that like a hole in the head, but... You understand, in all these things, maybe you just found that out on the way to church. How happy are you going to be walking in? You're going to be burdened down, and that's going to be on your mind. So it's important that when we start with praise, you get to have your heart lifted up, and you start the action of laying that stuff down. And it concludes with worship, so that instead of just praise, where the army's beginning to march, worship, uh, in a picturesque kind of way, is when the army comes As a victorious group, they have vanquished the enemy. The enemy is put to flight, and now they give praise to the commander-in-chief. Who, in this case, right? He's the mighty warrior dressed for battle. And so, but it's got to conclude in worship so that we come, we move from the place of action and activity and clapping hands and all that stuff to a place where we're rendering our hearts and not just our hands. Something happens and something must happen that's powerful. And that's why you'll find your most active songs, generally speaking, at the beginning of the service, and then the more powerful, majestic, deep, moving songs toward the end of a worship service. Now, there are those times when the Holy Spirit moves in such a way that maybe you end up with a powerful kind of a marching song uh, or a joy-filled song, and that's okay too. But generally speaking, Praise sets the table for worship. Now listen to this. Worship sets the table for God's Word. 
Because when you're all stressed out and beaten up and got so many things in your mind, I could preach my brains out, you'll at best retain 10%. The rest is already history. Because I will give you an exit interview and 90% of people won't even remember the title of the message, let alone what was said. I know, I've been doing this a couple years. So if that's the case, if, if many people can't even remember the title, now I've helped you out immensely by actually giving you an outline that in code has the title on it. But if people generally, without this, wouldn't even remember accurately what the title was, I mean accurately, what chance is there that the content of the word will be retained. Very slim. So that's why these are tools for you. These are worksheets for you. They are tools, not only so you could go back over them, but listen to this, so that you can minister to your friends and relatives and co-workers as the Holy Spirit brings you opportunities, and this will give you lots of ammunition. Hello? Because I'm always thinking, maybe I'm assuming, and I know what happens when you assume, but I'm willing to assume on you that some of you will actually take this and use it and share it with other people. So I'm, going to, I'm willing to assume, and I know what happens when you assume. Now, let me help you out with this. The word praise means this, and I won't bore you with the Hebrew and the Greek words, but I, want, I will say this to you. The word praise, now I want you to picture what's going on with the description of each word. The word for praise means to give loud thanks. It means to boast about. And listen to this last definition. It means to be clamorously foolish, which would include jumping, shouting, praising, running back and forth, whatever the thing is. To be acting clamorously foolish. That's what the word praise means and involves. Boasting about the Lord. Being foolish in other people's eyes, in the eyes of the flesh, that is. And to give loud thanks. Now let me contrast it with the word worship. There's a couple, two or three actual words for worship, but I'm going to give you the heart of what the word worship means. Now you'll see the difference here. It means to lie prostrate before. And it's not prostate, it's prostrate. Most people butcher those two words. Like I just had somebody say today, I was saying to him, so, boy, is this different for you? She said, so different, it's radically different, like a 360 for me. And I thought, that's not so different. By the way, if you say it's a 360, don't think you're saying different. What you're saying is, I do go a lot of places, but I wind up right back where I started. And so I just kind of smiled. I said, yeah. yeah. All right. Worship means to lie prostrate before, as opposed to what? Jumping, shouting, and giving thanks. All right, now listen to the second definition. It means to bow down and pay homage to a superior. To bow down and pay homage to. That means to worship uh, to adore. And third, it means to fall down before. Now, one of them means to jump and shout. Can you see how the last one means to fall down before? There is no jumping. There is no shouting. There is a high praise, is otherwise known as worship, and it means that you bow down, not jump up. I can see you're underwhelmed, so I'm going to keep working at you now. I bet you didn't know those words existed. That's why whenever I'm describing the beginning of our service, I say, well, we begin the night with praise and worship. I never just say praise, and I never just describe it as worship. I said we begin every, every worship service, if you will, every service with praise and worship. Because I'm already assuming we're going to start with praise, we're going to move to worship, and it's going to set the table and prepare the hearts so that the baggage is offloaded and people actually have a chance of having the good seed of God's Word find prepared soil. 
Other than that, you can take the best seed in the world and throw it on concrete and even water it. Good luck. You see, the quality of the seed is important, but just as important, listen to this, is the preparation and the condition of the soil. And without real worship, you leave unchanged, largely, other than, wow, I didn't know that scripture was in the Bible. Well, that's great. That's great. I appreciate the insight, and I thank God that you got some insight. But we're not just about getting biblical insights. We're about letting the Lord transform hearts. We're not in the entertainment business. This is serious stuff. All right, so let's go to Roman numeral 3 now because we're not going to go back and cover what worship is not. We've already done that on Sunday. So let's continue on. Let's discover what worship is and, in fact, always should be. Here we go. Ready? Number one, worship, number one, is a response to God. That means the response for what he's done for us should be nothing less than worship. Worship is a response to God. It's a response for his good, to his goodness. It's a response to his presence. And look at the, uh, look at the scripture, 1 John 4.19, right under point number one. It says, we love him because what? He first loved us. You understand that no, that no matter what we're going through right now, if we just think a little bit, we can always find many, many things to thank Him for. That's why thanksgiving is such a powerful force in Scripture. In fact, Paul said it in 1 Thessalonians 5. He said, we can let all our requests be made known unto God, but we got to approach Him with thanksgiving. Our requests need to be coupled with thanksgiving because if they're not, they very often can be prayer requests centered on selfishness. And this is what I want you to do, Lord. This is what I want to happen. This is what I need you to do. What if the Lord's saying, what I need to do in you is to change you? If I could change you, you wouldn't pray those foolish prayers. You would pray prayers that are accurate, that I would actually honor and answer because you allowed me to change your priorities. Wow. We've got to be very careful, intentional, of remembering what he's already done for us. Because the moment we lose sight of that, we're, all, we're going to just be short-sighted and be reflecting on what we don't have right now. But what about the stuff he's brought us from? What about the things that he's already done? Let's take a look at a couple of scriptures here for that, can we? Let's go to Psalm 40. Uh-oh. Psalm 40. It's a great psalm, another psalm of David. And we'll read the first uh, three verses or so. David said in verse 1 of Psalm 40, I waited patiently for the Lord. Do you see what, uh, what we have to do in most cases? You've got to wait for his perfect timing, and you've got to find grace to give you patience. Our needs don't put him in a rush. Hello? Our needs or our perceived needs never put God in a rush, unfortunately. Or fortunately. Now, he said, I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined to me. That means he kind of bowed his head down and turned his ear toward me. And he heard my cry. Verse 2. Now look at this. He brought me up out of a horrible pit. Let me just paraphrase by saying what he's saying here is where I was and where I might have been today, God stepped in and changed. Where I was, and only God knows where I would have been today had the Lord not intervened in my life. Maybe I'd be dead today. He brought me up out of that horrible situation. Listen, when you're unsaved and you're blind, many times what you think is good, you look back years later and say, what was I thinking? That was horrible. How stupid was I? But you're blind. 
and the devil has a hook in your jaw, and he's ready to reel in a tuna. You're the big tuna. Powerful. Now David goes on to say this. He brought me up out of the horrible pit that the devil had prepared for me. In fact, had me in. He took me out of that miry clay. It's like you're walking through the woods. You're taking your time. You're, having, you're enjoying the scenery, and you go into quicksand, and there's no one there to rescue you, and your whole life is flashing in before you as you're sinking. And you realize, I'm going to die out here alone. My cries are going to go unanswered, and I'm going to suffocate. And then vultures and animals and predators are going to come and eat me alive. But the Lord steps in. He said, you're in quicksand, son. You're in quicksand. Maybe the quicksand is not drugs or alcohol. How about the quicksand being you're in emotional distress, you're an emotional wreck, your anger, your bitterness, your self-destructive. Maybe the way you're thinking is so destructive that it's going to cut your throat and ruin your life. But I'm going to step in. And I'm going to take you, not out of a pit that you can see, but I'm going to take you out of that miry clay, listen, that takes you down slowly. See, the difference in the clay and the pit is that the pit very often was exactly that. It was a large hole covered with leaves and twigs so that an animal would come and either get hung up in a net or go straight into the pit. But the clay is different. The clay was like that quicksand where you stepped in. You thought maybe I'm just stepping through a very shallow puddle and instead, and there you go. And your whole life is flashing before you. Five years, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, 25 years of your life. And then you wake up one day and say, what have I done with my life? The prime years of my life are gone. And the devil had me. Look at what he does. He takes some people out of a direct pit. He takes some people out of that slow, destroying clay. And he takes both. And he sets our feet upon the rock. Aren't you glad? Jesus is a rock in a weary land. A shelter in a time of storm. I love that old hymn of the faith. Jesus is a rock in a weary land. And not only does he put us upon the rock, but he establishes our steps from that moment on. That means he puts our lives absolutely perpendicular. Where maybe we were stumbling through life. That word established means he sets us at a 90 degree angle. He sets us aright. He causes his plans and purposes to begin to be laid out before us. And he takes away the foolishness. Wow, we got a couple things to be thankful for. In case you ever forget, don't think you're all that. Look at people in the world, how messed up so many people are. Some are wearing suits and ties. And some are on the street corners. And they're a mess. Families are a mess. Their lives are a mess. Their marriages are a mess. And they don't even realize the worst is yet to come. Because those things don't straighten themselves out. Without the Lord in this crazy world, you don't have a prayer. Oh, now listen to this. When he takes us out of that clay and he takes us out of that pit, he sets our feet upon the rock. He establishes our steps. That means he puts us on a strong, certain, sure, new path in life. He doesn't stop there. I want you to see what he does in verse 3. He puts a new mumbling in our mouth. Is that what it says? He just puts a new complaint in our mouth. He puts something else to whine about in our mouth. He puts a new song in our mouth. The song of the Lord. A new song. Maybe the old song used to sing is how dry I am. But the new song, far different. It's, oh, 
there is a river that makes glad the city of God. Rivers of living water. Thank you, Lord, that the roots of my life are planted by the rivers of water. And though other people may wither and die around me, my leaf will never wither. I will bear fruit in my season, and no evil shall befall me. That's a new song. You understand that you can't sing a new song sometimes until you get a new mentality. You don't get a new mentality. The only thing that you'll be rehearsing back through your mouth is the old song you used to sing. You got to let the Lord renew your mind so that you begin to sing a new song. And look at what the song includes. It involves and revolves around. It's a song of praise to our God. And when God changes our life and we begin to sing a new song and live a new life and He establishes a new path in life, many are going to see it and fear. And then, consequently, they'll come to put their trust in the Lord. Because our lives are supposed to be living letters to a fallen, broken world. If people can't see the gospel work in us, who are they going to see it working? Why do you think the Lord takes a gamble on us? And when, he, when, he, when we're born again, He doesn't immediately say, I know this person's going to screw everything up so badly, I better just snatch him to heaven now. He said, I'm going to take a chance on you. I'm going to work you over, and I'm going to work on you, and I'm going to transform you because I need you to be a signpost pointing others to me. I need people that are traffic directors, traffic coordinators, air traffic controllers. Because people right now are in a tailspin in the Bermuda Triangle. Wow. Now go to the second psalm, Psalm 100. Can you see how worship is a response to God? Thank you, all two of you. Worship is a response to God. Now look at Psalm 100. It's a very short psalm, so let me read it. It says, Make a joyful shout unto the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with... Oh, man, I have to go to church again? No, you don't have to. You get to, knucklehead. You get to die. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before His presence with what? Singing. I want you to see all the action words. You see what He's saying to us? You've got to come. You got to present yourself. You got to sing. You got to present yourself before the Lord. He's not going to present himself before you, other than to maybe give you a good spanking. Verse 3 here's why we have to do it. Know that the Lord, He's God. You know what the implication is? And you're not. It is He who has made us, we haven't made ourselves. We are His people. We're not our own. Once you come to Christ, you've been bought with a price. We're His people. We are the sheep of... Who owns the pasture? His pasture. Uh-oh. Verse 4. Enter into His gates with thanksgiving. You know what? This is given a word picture of Solomon's temple. Solomon's temple had the outer gates. Boom. Big outer gates. When you came from the street, if you will, into the temple property itself, you entered into through the gates. When you came through that initial gate, you had to bring a sacrifice every step of the way. And, and spiritually speaking, the first sacrifice you bring is thanksgiving. When you're going to approach the Lord, you've got to reflect already back on what He's done for you, not what you want. That takes place at the altar. But you just enter in the gates. You got no right to come any closer without a sacrifice going before you. That was the rule of coming into that temple proper. And the, the deeper you got into it, the more precious the sacrifice had to come 
And ultimately, blood had to precede anybody going in there or your history. Enter into his gates. You better be bringing something. Now, because he doesn't need your money and he doesn't need this, you got to bring what? What he says in Hebrews. Bring the, the fruit of your lips, the sacrifice of praise. Now, when you come into those outer gates, now you come into the courts, which are now you're getting ready to go into the temple itself. When you come into the courts, just before entering in, you've got to bring another sacrifice. And the sacrifice that you now have to bring is praise. You're heating up now. You're heating up, see? He said, come in with thanksgiving. That means reflecting back on what I've already done. Now that you're going to come closer, you've got to bring the sacrifice of praise now. He said, be thankful to him and bless his name. When you talk about blessing his name, that means to speak to the Lord. That means to lift up and magnify the name of the Lord. Verse 5, here's why. For the Lord is good and his mercy is everlasting. And his truth endures to all generations. Isn't that powerful? Can you see the imagery that's loaded into the scriptures? And what's required of us? Because God has loved us. He has saved us. He has delivered us. There's something that he requires from us. Something that he expects from us. Go to one more scripture. Um, Romans chapter 12. It's not on my notes, so I want to make sure it's... Uh, <clears throat> Romans 12. Yes. <clears throat> Let's read verses 1 and 2. I promise you this. If you're paying attention, you're never, never going to look at praise and worship the same again. Look at verse 1 of Romans 12. Paul said, I beg you, I beseech you. That means to beg. He said, I'm begging you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you do the following things. First, that you present your bodies. Well, I never come to church, pastor, but I'm with you in spirit. Doesn't count. Thank God the cleaning ministry doesn't say, I'm running the vacuum today, pastor, in spirit. Because <laughs> if I saw that bad boy uh, moving by itself, then I'd say, all right, he's either a miracle or a devil. But at some point, a body has to show up, generally speaking. That's why he's, he said it's always going to come down to an act of the will. At some point, you have to present your body. He's not going to drag your body. You've got to present your body. That's the spirit of sacrifice. Now, get this. You've got to present your bodies as a sacrifice, but instead, again, the imagery of Solomon's temple. They used to take the animal that a family was going to bring as a sacrifice. There were many, many sacrifices, but let's say it was a burnt offering. Whatever the, uh, the, the family was going to sacrifice, they would bring to the priest, and he would very specifically and ceremoniously check it out, look it over, make sure that it was the best of the best, etc. And when he laid his hands on it, it got the approval. That means it was sanctified and consecrated, ready to, uh, to be brought before the Lord. And when they would go through all this, they would then take that animal, and they would cut the throat very often, and remove the blood, but then that animal's body would be put on the altar, and quite often that thing would be tied down. The animal would have to be tied. So it wasn't a really a living sacrifice, because against its will, it was held there. But not for us. See, the Lord said, I will not take anything. What do you think Paul said? He said, if you're going to give even financially to the Lord grudgingly or complaining or out of mere obligation, keep it. Because you've already lost your blessing. You already lost the return. Why bother sowing it? 
It's like buying a stock in a company that's just going bankrupt in an hour. He said, if you're going to give, you've got to give with a willing spirit. You've got to give joyfully. God loves a cheerful giver, not a grumpy one. Because you don't have to give, you get to give. He said, I'm going to allow you to sow into a kingdom that will never be shaken, that will always bring you a return, unlike Wall Street. You don't ever have to worry about the return. The return will always be coming your way. Cast your bread upon the waters, and it will return to you wave after wave after many days. Just like a message in a bottle. When you need it, it's going to be there. You don't want a tidal wave. You want to be able to stand at that ocean front and have each wave bring you what you need. Because a tidal wave destroys more than it does good. And you get too much too soon without your character and your spirit being ready and your life being in order. Even the blessing of the Lord can destroy many people. That's why people being used in ministry things too soon, too much, can actually be destroyed. 1 Timothy 3 says, the, pro, the a trap of the devil for young ministry people is pride. Now check this out. He said you've got to present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God. Now you see this last phrase? Which is your reasonable Service, right? Which is your reasonable service. Now, I love, uh, I think the New American Standard has it this way. Which is your spiritual service of worship? Get that. He said, when you present your bodies to do whatever, whether it's preaching or cleaning the restroom, when you do it in the name of the Lord, it's a spiritual service or act of worship. Preaching or cleaning the restroom. It's an act of worship that is spiritual in nature and it brings a spiritual reward. Now this translation, the New King James says, which is only reasonable. That means, man, you shouldn't even be thinking about doing less than this in light of what the Lord's done for us. It's reasonable. Now look at the second verse. And he said, and while you're doing that, because you see the first word in verse 2 is and. It's a thought that's connecting what he just said in verse 1 with what he's about to say now in verse 2. And he said, and while you're bringing your body and you're serving the Lord and here you are getting plugged in, he said, and, oh, by the way, don't just think that everything in the kingdom of God is about the natural acts of service. He said, and while you're doing that, you got to resist being conformed to the shape, the image, the thinking, the speech patterns, the mentality of this world. And the only defense that you have against the pressure of conforming to this world's opinions and standards and values is to have your mind uh, to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Now, the word transformed means you go through a complete metamorphosis like a, a caterpillar turns into a moth or a butterfly. You've got to go through an entire metamorphosis. He says, as you allow the Lord to bring you through this process, remember like the caterpillar winds up being a butterfly, it's got to go through the process of, of this uh, tra transformation, and then it goes into a cocoon and all this kind of stuff. But when it comes out, it flies away and fulfills its ultimate destiny. But you've got to be transformed. And what transforms you? Now, now I thought, always thought this was interesting. He doesn't say what transforms you is when Jesus touches your spirit and you get born again. No, he's already talking to Christians here. He's already talking to Christians here. And he said, as a Christian, the only hope you have of not having this world pour you like liquid plastic into its mold is by you consistently be being transformed by the renewing of the knuckleheaded mind. That's the only hope you have is between your ears. 
Because he's already talking to Christians. Well, as long as I get saved, I'm all set. No, you get saved, you're all set for heaven, but you're not all set for earth. <laughs> and because you've got to live here for a few years, you can be living miserably or victoriously. You can be like Paul and get radically transformed and set your face like a flint. Or you can be like the children of Israel wandering through the wilderness. 40 years in the same stinking desert. Ooh, ooh, boy. Boy, we're getting a lot of exercise. Yeah, but you're not getting anywhere. So I hope at least you get in shape. For what? I don't know. And then you go around the mountain. Oh, yeah, JP was here. Yeah, JP was here. 1999, 2000, 2001, 2002. Finally, you just, uh, just kind of go one, two, three. One, two, three, four. Why bother putting the years down there? God doesn't want that. He said, I want you to be like Paul. He got radically transformed. Brought out into the desert. The Lord had to cause him to unlearn a bunch of religious trash and then get imparted to scriptural stuff. And then he set his face like a flint. He became a dangerous character to the devil. You know why? Because he was passionately sold out. Sometimes he had to be restrained. That guy was so bottom line focused that he would steamroll people if he got in his way. So he had to be restrained a little bit and chiseled off a little bit. But listen, he got things done because of that quality in him that refused to be denied. That fighting spirit that refused distractions, that refused diversions is why the Lord used him preeminently in the New Testament. Mm -mm -mm. He's my hero besides Jesus. Paul, he's my hero. I can relate to him more than anybody else in Scripture. You might have your favorites. When you get to heaven, you can have a nice conversation with them. <laughs> in the meantime, you got work to do. So don't be so heavenly minded, you're no earthly good. Let's go to number two. And we'll stop here. We're, uh, number two, what worship is, remember, number one, worship is a response to God. Number two, worship is something that must be heartfelt and sincere. It must be heartfelt and sincere. And look at what Jesus said about that in John chapter 4. Jesus said, but the hour is coming... And now is, when true worshipers, now if he uses the word true, that means conceivably there could be false. Right? False. Now, the word false maybe is too strong of a contrast in the sense that uh, people, as though people would come to purposely be phonies. There are some people like that. But how about the people that just want to go so far. They only want to go so far. Listen, I know churches that would never play music like you heard tonight. Never. Because they, they would think, man, it's way too contemporary. We want it to be stoic and socially acceptable. And Well, good for you. But you won't find a person under 40 in your church. Oops. <laughs> it's the truth. Why? Because that religious spirit that will only go so far. I know I've known pastors that if the service more went more than 29.3 minutes, there was a staff meeting and heads rolled. I mean, heads are gonna roll. Sorry. I will not play that game. I don't knock them for doing it. I just couldn't live that way. I could never be in ministry that way. Because what can you possibly get done in a whole service, 29 minutes? What can you possibly get done? What kind of depth of truth can that preacher possibly bring God's people into? None. And when you consider that my role in the kingdom of God is to bring you into the deeper paths of truth, 
as God reveals it to me. That's my job. God, help me if I bring you to a level one shallow, like a parking lot puddle, a mile wide and an inch deep. That's pathetic. Because, you can't, because the Holy Spirit can't build anything on legs that are weak. The Holy Spirit can't build anything on the flesh. He can only build on spiritual people. What weight can the Holy Spirit put on the flesh? Paul said, I have no confidence in the flesh. That flesh is going one place to the cross. The flesh is useless. Oh, Lord Jesus. Go with me to John chapter 6. So you've got to ask yourself daily, am I growing? Am I growing? Or just do, I know, do I just know the Bible? Well, I go to a church that preaches the Bible. Yeah, but are you growing? What kind of preaching of the Bible is going on? Not like some of these preachers on TV. Some. Some are good and some are mind-boggling to me. Certainly when somebody calls it teaching, it blows my mind. It's nothing more than mere exhortation. Uh Uh-oh, it got mighty quiet. And there's nothing wrong with exhortation, but it better have some depth to it beyond that. Don't worry, because, listen, leave that to the football coach. Leave that to a motivational speaker, not a preacher of God's truth. Leave that to the football coach of life. Come on, you can do it. Come on, ready? One, two, three. Ah! Well, that's great, but what does that have to do with crucifying the flesh and taking that person into the deep waters of the Spirit? Not a thing. Nothing. You can make it. Come on, you can make it. How? I don't have a clue, but you can make it. Just remember that. Ridiculous. Ridiculous. You haven't built them strong and tough. You haven't trained them. It's like a trainer in a gym. Trainer in a gym ultimately should only get value by the results seen in his or her clients. Otherwise, they're useless. Yeah, maybe they got the motivational piece, but how about the skill set to take someone who's madly out of shape and bring them into conditioning and to reach their goals. Motivation is one part. Skills are the second. <laughs> and they might have to tell that person some truths along the way that they don't, they don't want to hear. Listen, you can't eat four Jim Dandies a week. I'm, I'm sorry. You just can't do it. What do you mean? I'm paying you. Yeah, you're paying me, but you're paying me ostensibly to tell you the truth. And four gym dandies and hot fudge sundays are not going to help you. (laughs) For as good as they are. Well, I'm going to fire you. I don't want to come back to you. You bum me out. Okay, then I bum you out. But you can't say that I took your money and led you down a shallow path. See that? That's the trade-off. That's the trade-off of good leadership. Now, check this out. John chapter 6. When Jesus talked about um, the need, you know, you got to eat of my flesh and drink of my blood, and he, he, what was he doing, man? He was taking the multitudes that followed him for the free lunch program. And he was trying to, he said, okay, you like the free lunch program? Yeah, that's great. But now I'm going to take you into the deep waters. You ready for this? Yeah. You eat of the fish, you ate of the chips. Now I want to take you to the real food from heaven. What's that? You better eat of my flesh and drink of my blood, because if you don't, you have no part of me. And you will spiritually starve to death while your body is fat. So check this out. He says all that, and in verse 60, let's see Jesus' result. Therefore, many of his disciples, when they heard this, they said, Man, this is a hard saying. This is too hard. He's a bummer. He bummed me out. And some of his own disciples were saying this. Oh, man. I thought he was a motivational speaker. 
What's, what's, what's with this? Does somebody offend him? Verse 61. Did he have too much espresso today? When Jesus knew within himself that even his disciples were complaining about this level of teaching, he said to them, oh, by the way, did that teaching offend you? Does it cause you to stumble? Verse 62. If that causes you to stumble, what are you going to do if you see the Son of Man ascend to heaven right before your eyes? What are you going to do with that brain teaser? Now, verse 63, Jesus explains why he had to do that previous teaching and why some people followed him no more from that day on. And he said, I don't care. I don't care. Because they wanted the things of the flesh, not the things of the Spirit. And I will not build my kingdom on fleshly people. I can only build on people that allow me to transform them into spiritual giants. So Jesus wraps things up by saying, verse 63, to his disciples that did not run away. He said, boys, you better understand something. It is only the Spirit who gives life. The flesh will profit you nothing from this moment on. Get it through your head. The party is over. I am building the kingdom, not running a circus or a free lunch program. Now, he said, and from this moment on, I want you to wrap your head around this reality. The words that I speak to you, they are spirit and they are life. Now, when you dissect that last sentence, this is what Jesus is saying. The words that I speak to you are spirit-inspired, spirit-anointed, will leave you with a deposit of revelation and the ultimate deposit that you will receive, that word life means the life of God will be imparted to you as you allow me to transform you. Because that word life is the word from the Greek that means the life of God, not biological life. So when you say, Lord, fill me with your spirit, he said, I will, but I'm going to kill your flesh first. Well, I don't, well ho, ho, ho now. He said, okay, let's renegotiate then. You want it or not? That's the only negotiation. Well, uh, I want part of it. <clears throat> nope. You decide, then get back to me. Ooh. See, this blows religion away. Religion says, do your own thing, just show up a couple times a year, put on a good show, be good on the outside, and your inside is full of dead men's bones and all uncleanness, but that's okay. And Jesus said, no, 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 I'm going to blow that stuff up. I'm going to smoke that stuff out. That's a stench in my nostrils. Whoa. Incredible. And that's what we're being drawn into. Listen, when you think about worship, that's why worship has to be heartfelt and sincere. Let's look at that verse one more time, right under point two. We're going to close with this. Jesus said the hour is coming, and now is, when true worshipers will worship the Father, how? In spirit and in truth. That means in heartfelt sincerity and truthfulness. When, when people come worshiping him with a ag secret agenda, well, maybe if I just worship harder, he'll answer this prayer. Oh, yeah! Don't bother. That's what he's saying. Don't bother. You having a good time? Yeah. Don't bother. You don't worship me with an agenda. You worship me for who I am. Jesus said, you got to come to worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Now look at the last part. For the Father is seeking such to worship Him. Notice what the Father is not seeking. He's not seeking worship. 
He's seeking worshipers. He doesn't need therapy. Would you please worship me? Please, please, just a little bit, please. Oh, oh, that feels so much better. Thank you. He's not looking for worship. He's looking for worshipers. Because Jesus himself said, if I want to worship, man, even the rocks will cry out. But getting worshipers is harder because they have a free will. They're either going to lay it down and use it or they're going to pull it back and use it for their own thing. That's, why, that's how I know a true worshiper. A true worshiper lays down what they could do to what they should do. And he honors that every time. Listen, the Lord will honor that every time. You want to come into the deep things of God? He wants your heart. He wants your heart. Until he gets it, there's going to be this tug of war where you're going to know there's so much more. I know there's so much more. I know there's so much more, but you can never quite get there. And the issue will always be your heart. Might as well give it to him. Just let him have his way. Say, Lord, have your way in me. We are servants of the Most High God. When he can get someone that has that attitude, there's nothing he won't do in them, through them, with them, and for them because he can trust them with the treasure. Let's stand together. God bless you, everybody.